While his love burns true and bright, we are walking in the light he has shown us the road. We his glory must reflect, lest our dimness and neglect keep some soul from its God. The love of God within the heart will kindly now. The heart is made his dwelling place. The love of God glows like a flame. Through endless years it is the same. The love of God will never fail nor lose its word of songs up to you and, and it is our hope that this is uplifting to you as it is uplifting to us. Uh, dear Lord, we have those that are not with us here today. We have several members that are sick. Uh, we ask you to strengthen them, uh, heal their bodies, return them to us, dear Lord. And there's some, some scary things going around with the coronavirus and just other ailments among us here and we ask that these be lifted up to you and, and you guide the doctors' minds and hearts. You ensure that those among us that are sick, that, that they can get better and will get better to the Lord. The Lord, I ask you to be with Matt and the other men that are leading this worship service this morning and be with them, strengthen them, help them speak the truth. Help our hearts and our minds open up and, and hear what we are being taught and, and take it and spread it among those out in this, this world that, that so desperately needs it now, dear Lord. Dear Lord, throughout this week, let us be examples. Let us show you the grace that you show to us. Let us show the love that your, your son Jesus came and, and shared among us. And let us teach others that that is just waiting for them if they are willing to be a part of it, dear Lord. Lord, be with us this week. Be with us this week. Let us do these things as all is in accordance with your will and your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our song before the Lord's Supper this morning is Alas, and did my Savior believe. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for crimes that I have done? He Oh, my. 
Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. If anyone did not get uh, a cup and bread from outside, if you raise your hand at this time, if you need one, we'll have someone bring it to you. It's a great opportunity we have to take a minute out of our busy daily lives to stop and reflect on the great sacrifice that was made by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He didn't have to come to this earth. He didn't have to die on that tree. But he freely chose to do so for the sins of the world. For every individual in this room, and every individual that's been, and every individual that, that will be. I can take a moment and just clear the things out of your mind from this week. Forget about all the things that are going on politically, coronavirus your finances, your family, take a minute and turn your thoughts back to that cross on Calvary over 2,000 years ago where Jesus Christ hung and bled and died for a mission of our sins. I'd like to read to you this morning from 1 Corinthians 11, starting the 23rd verse. For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. At this time, we'll go to our God in prayer for the bread. Would you bow with me, please? Oh, Lord, my God, we're so thankful for the sacrifice that your son made, that you made by sending him to this earth, that he was freely willing to die that we may have that hope of eternal life. Lord, this time we pray that you will bless this bread which represents his body that hung on that cross. Lord, we pray that we'll do this in a manner as well pleasing to you. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament, my blood. This to you as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Would you bow to me, please? Oh, Lord my God, as we continue this observance of the Lord's Supper, we pray that you will bless this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your Son that was shed on that cross. Lord, help us not to partake of this lightly or as a routine, but to think about the sacrifice and the pain and the death of Jesus Christ, who died for us, died for me, died for you. Thank you so much for all the blessings. We pray that you will bless this fruit of the vine for us. And that you'll help us and be with us always, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. That concludes our observance of the Lord's Supper. If you didn't have an opportunity to give as you came through the lobby, there is a uh, couple of boxes out there for you to do so. And you may also do it online. I know this is different due to coronavirus. We can't pass trades and do the things we're so accustomed to. 
But if you will do that, we will certainly appreciate it. And this time, I'd like to pray for that offering. Our Lord and our God, we're so thankful for the blessings you've given us. We take these blessings so often we're granted, Lord, for the food we have to eat, the roofs over our head, warm beds to sleep in, for our jobs, our families, our cars, all the things that we have that we consider routine and mundane, so many people throughout the world do not have. We're so thankful for this, and we would ask at this time as you, uh, we return a portion of what we have earned, that you will help us to use this money as well to spread your word throughout your kingdom, and that you will help us to always remember that all blessings, Lord, come from you. Thanks so much again for all the blessings you give us. We pray that you will continue to help us, watch over us, and love us, Lord. Of course, in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Our song before the scripture reading and Matt's lesson is The Lord My Shepherd Is, and I'm going to ask us to stand together as we sing and remain standing for the reading of God's word after this song. everyone get an outline? I don't even know if we need to call them bulletins anymore because Lord willing for the rest of this year they're going to serve as outlines and uh, we've been talking about doing this for a few years now and these are even for our little ones to fill in the blanks. The outline is on here but there are blanks to be filled in and perhaps uh, will uh, help us keep more focused on, uh, on the lesson and the thoughts presented as we continue our theme for this year of unity. And we're going to begin uh, our discussion on marriage, unity in marriage. Because you know, a church can only be as strong as its marriages. 
And we're going to see in this lesson today where the Lord equates the marriage of a husband and wife and Christ and the church. So we're going, so have your outline. Does anybody need an outline? We can still get you one if you don't have one. If you see uh, your neighbor not having one, go ahead and raise your hand for him or her and we'll, we'll, we'll get them one too because it's going to be important. Here's one down here, uh, ushers, please. Uh, to be able to follow along, we're going to be jumping from Genesis 2 to Ephesians 5 uh, extensively today. So please, uh, please have those scriptures available and your outline ready to roll. Um, this is not uh, typically the way I would present a lesson, so I'm still going to try to bring across the pathos of the message and not let it fall into a lecture kind of idea even though we will be bringing uh, points specifically from our outline. As we get started, I, wanted to, I want to ask those of you that have been married between 25 years and 40 years, would you stand up please? Between 25 and 40 years, please stand up. Between, now wait a minute. Between 25 and 40 years. <laughs> I know that's not right. If you have been married, whether you're a widow or a widower, it doesn't matter. If you were married or are married between 25 and 40 years, please stand. All right, very good. Be seated, please. Thank you. If you have been married between 40 and 50 years, please stand. 40 to 50 years. Widow, widowers, 40 to 50 years. All right, very good. We're honoring marriage today. We're giving honor to whom honor is due. If you have been married 50 to 60 years, would you please stand? All right, very good. Note this company and devote yourselves to them, those that are younger. Be seated, please. Thank you. If you have been married over 60 years, if you're currently married over 60 years, you're a widow, widower, been married 60 years or more, please stand. Wow. All right. Very good. Very good. Be seated, please. Okay, everybody that has been married 25 years or less, if you're a newlywed, will you stand? 25 years or less. All right, very good. This, you can be seated, please. Thank you. This series of lessons dealing with marriage is for everyone, but particularly this last group that has stood. If there is one area of our lives that we need to talk about, that we need to have great examples, it is in the area of marriage. Huge, huge subject in the Word of God. The profound fundamental undergirding thought or concept of the Bible, I believe, is this. It's all about God. Would you agree with that? If, if, if I were to give a theme of the Bible, it would be all about God. If I would give a thesis of the Bible, it would be salvation. But it's all about God. Whatever we think, whatever we say, whatever, however we act, it's all about, to the very best of our ability, giving glory to Almighty God. No matter what the issue is. Now, in the end, we will reap the reward, and it will be a little more all about us then. But right now, to the degree we can make it all about God, and you know like the song, the progression song we sing? Uh, help me. None of self and all of thee. Um, how we progress in that song from, you know, we, we start with too much of self and not enough of thee, to the last verse... None of self and all of thee. That's the maturity in, 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 that we see in Christ. But that, that resounds with every area of our life, but especially about marriage. I want to suggest something to you. 
Hint, hint, here's the first one on our outline. I'm not going to do this ever again in 52 weeks. Just make sure you're paying attention at first. Hint, hint. Marriage belongs to God. God holds the patent. So go ahead and write the words in that first line. Marriage belongs to God. It's not my marriage. It's not my body. It's not my house, my car, my family, my kids. It is all God's. God is the creator and by rights of creation, he holds the patent. So it's not just a matter of am I happy in my marriage. God wants me to be happy. If I hear that one more time in counseling, I think I'm going to flip. I mean, I, I want to climb the walls when I hear that. It's about God. Make yourself happy. And when both partners are doing that, that's your marriage made in heaven. But that marriage belongs to God. There's not only one set of handcuffs, folks. There's a second set. A third set. Where the other arms are, are tied to God. God dictates the terms. And we follow those terms because we love him. And he holds the patent. Marriage must follow his design if it's going to be a marriage. And that marriage is one man, one wife for life. That is what God's Word teaches. Well, when we think of marriage, marriage is a contract not only between two people but between those two people and God it's not an accident marriage isn't something that was initiated or begun in the mind of man just to for whatever reason marriage was something that is ordained of God and when we think of the three great institutions of life when we think of the church and the government and marriage, guess which one was first? It's this one. It's the marriage relationship. You and I are not at liberty to dictate what that marriage looks like. Though many try to do that today. God was the first father to give his daughter away. And we see that in Genesis chapter 2. Look, begin at, uh, at uh, verse 18. God declared that it was not good for man to be alone. That is God's universal principle. That's why he established the church, the government, and marriage. Man was never intended to live life on an island by himself. It is not good for man to be alone. So whatever else we read in Scripture, that fundamental idea needs to reign supreme. It is not good for man to be alone. So God made him a helper, comparable, not exactly like. Amen? Comparable. Bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. He looked out among all of the beasts that he created and he didn't find a suitable partner for the man. So Adam names the creatures and then after that task, God caused Adam to go to sleep. And from Adam, he was going to bring forth the crown of all creation. And from a rib of Adam's side, he took it and formed the woman. And here is God in the first marriage ceremony giving away his daughter. The Bible says he brought the woman to the man. And then became from that a one flesh relationship. Marriage parallels our relationship with God. Is it of any little significance that when we look at God's relationship with man, how many times the word one comes up? And when we look at man's relationship with his wife, the word one comes up. These two things are so parallel 
that no wonder God doesn't want many churches because in the Bible, when we see this relationship, the husband portrays Jesus and the wife portrays the church. Oh, that puts it in a very different category. And in Ephesians 5, when Paul talks about man's responsibility to his wife, he's to love his wife as Christ loved and died for the church. The reason why marriages fail from the husband's standpoint is because he doesn't love his wife like Christ loved the church. And so in the Bible, the wife portrays the church. And that's why Paul would say in Ephesians 5, listen, wives, you submit to your husbands just as you would submit to Jesus Christ himself. Oh, I know in this time, I, you know, one reason they put a podium up here is so a preacher can go like this. I know that that's not a very, a very nice thought in our, our uh, post women's lib society. But reasons why marriages don't work from the wives' standpoint is they don't submit or obey their husbands as they would obey Christ. Same word there, by the way. When those two things happen, and when both sides of that marriage allow the other one to love them as Christ loved the church, and the husband acts in such a way to where the wife would want to follow and submit to her husband, then you have the marriage made in heaven. But when those borders and those definitions and those parameters are tampered with and are misdefined as the word marriage is itself, then you have the problem of marriage, which we'll look at the third point. Notice in our outline now, we're painting the picture of marriage. We're going to look at the purpose of marriage and then the problem of marriage. And that will take care of our two points in our general outline. It is a one flesh relationship. When we become, no, notice how this is pictured. When you and I are baptized into Christ, we are going through that marriage ceremony of Jesus Christ and we become one. And he doesn't want any other wives. He doesn't want any other churches. He wants one body. He wants one relationship. And so it is physically with a husband and wife. When they get married, God doesn't want anything intruding, any other people intruding into that relationship. And we've got to protect that. We are shepherds, we are guardians, we are caretakers of that relationship. And God expects that. The husband then loves his wife with total sacrifice. Total sacrifice. That means taking the lead when there are things necessary for the enhancement of that marriage. You know, the, some, of the, some of the great ways, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. In fact, I'm not going to go there. I'll go there later. The husband loves his wife with total satisfaction. The wife gives herself completely to him with total submission as Submission is seen to Jesus Christ. That's tough. That's tough. But we're going to talk about ways that husbands can make it desires for a, for, a, for a wife to do that. The plan, this plan, when you look at the whole world from all time, this plan is inherent in all cultures across all time. This is what is intended. And you see this kind of arrangement now. You see a lot of, of the details tampered with in that arrangement, but you see the general makeup of a marriage like this since the beginning of time and no doubt will till the end of time. Man didn't come up with something this great. Man messed it up in many places. And so when we think of the purpose of marriage, we think of how marriage pictures salvation. Turn over to Ephesians 5. There are a couple of statements here that are astounding, are amazing. Notice when depicting this relationship, Paul says, Wives, submit to your own, uh, own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. 
So therefore, just as the search is subject, as the church is subject to Christ, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. One without the other here does not work. And that's why if a husband truly loves his wife, he's going to give her her way about 85% of the time. The 85-15 rule. It works. It works. Most things are not that significant. And let it ride. Honey, it's, it's about you. God does that with us, right? He gives us our way every time he can. About 15% of the thing. You know, we like to make it out, well, God is so hard. Christianity is so hard. I can't keep all these rules. I'm, and in fact, some religions even change God's word to say we're not rule keepers. We're, you know, we, we're really not under works at all. It's all grace. It's all, you know, and that's a mutilation of that part of marriage, the spiritual part to God. And sometimes we ruin marriages because we have that idea. 85, 15. And only use the 15 when you have to, not because of a personal desire, but for the good as the leader of this family spiritually. Sometimes the lines in the sand have to be drawn. Most times they do not. A wise husband that loves his wife will let that ride. Now, when we, when, when we come to this interesting part here in verse 27, of what this kind of arrangement looks like. Look at verse 27. That the husband might present the wife as a glorious church. What's the point of the church? It's to house the saved. And so as we're married to Christ, Christ the husband wants to present us a glorious church when he comes back and we go to judgment. He wants to present to his father a glorious church. Well, here, the husband has a responsibility as he lives in this life to present his wife as being sanctified, as being without spot and without blemish. Well, in order to do that, the husband, as the head of that relationship, needs to take the spiritual reins. And guess what husbands and wives need to do together? They need to read the Bible. You know, there are husbands and wives that don't read the Bible together. They don't pray together. Let it never be said in this audience. And if that is the case in your home, husbands, get off of your spiritual lazy and start. Because you have the responsibility, according to Ephesians 5, to present your wife and to present your children as glorious spiritual beings to God. Just like Jesus, as the husband does with his wife, the church. It's amazing, the correlation here between the two relationships. And the one flesh relationships, where the two become one. You know, it's interesting, when, we're, when we are dating Jesus Christ before we marry him in baptism, we, we, we study about him, we're, we're dating, we're getting to know him. Just like a, a man and a woman would do. And then before that marriage ceremony, we, we fix in our minds how we're to present ourselves to our spouse. You know why many marriages fail? It's all about them. Honey, I love you because of what you do to me. Oh, how you make me feel. Oh, how the, the meals you cook. Oh, how you let me hang with the buds. And, and, and how you, you're just so nice that way. I love you because of what all you do for me. You know, if we get one inkling of that with our children or with those that we might be talking to before they get married, we better hurry and encourage them, don't, don't pull the trigger yet. You got some growing up to do. Marriage and saying anytime we say I love you, what does that mean? When we say, God, I love you. If you tell me I tell you today sometime during the day I love you, if you tell your spouse, I love you, or you children, you love them, you're saying you first, and you stay into the background. When I think about marriage to God, I'm saying, God, you are, you hold the patent to this relationship. It's you first. 
first and it's my spouse first. And when you have two spouses arguing over who can do the most for each other, that's the marriage God wants. That's the balance one to hit. But the more that we, it's not about us, right? What's the theme of the Bible? It's all about God. So in everything that we do and think, it should be, how is this about God? How is this about God? Not me. And marriage is no different. Marriage is no different. Marriage, the purpose of marriage is to show the picture. And guess who the best evangelists are? What do we find from the New Testament? Husband and wife teams, men and women, going two by two. Why? Because they picture in their marriage the picture of salvation in the church. That's going to be a great lesson to teach, right? But you've got to develop that in the home before you can develop it anywhere else. Great marriages make great churches. Great marriages make great governments. Great marriages make great countries. Great marriages make great neighborhoods. Great marriages make everything great. But what's my concept of great? What all it brings to me? No, it's how much I can give to it. And that's the way it is with any relationship as well, isn't it? The greatness is determined by its weakest link and how much they are willing to give to it. The purpose of marriage also shows companionship and intimacy. Companionship and intimacy. It's to be had in that one flesh relationship and not outside. At least to this degree. They became one flesh. I think we understand what that means without any great elaboration. And so that spiritual intimacy, not necessarily from a physical standpoint, but that spiritual intimacy is to be seen in our own individual lives with Jesus Christ, married to him. And you see how one plays off the other. If our intimate spiritual relationship with Christ is what it should be, then guess what that intimate physical and spiritual relationship with our spouses should be? Those that love God the most love each other the best. And we control how much we love God and we control how much we love our spouse. We don't look heavenward and say, God, if you would just change your word a little bit, I would love you a lot better. We're in total control to love or not to love. That's, that's why God loved us. He gave, he gave us choice. And so it is in a marriage. Both parties must choose to love each other and not focus on the negative aspects of the spouse. Because you're always going to find one, aren't you? You know that, and that's why you justify it that way sometimes. Don't look for that. Companionship and intimacy. Also, a third purpose of marriage is procreation. God said to that first couple, be faithful, be fruitful, and add. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> My sons and daughters-in-law hear this all the time. Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. Grandparents especially use that a lot, right? Be fruitful and multiply. But that doesn't come from man either. That came from the, the creator. That is a purpose of marriage. But as we see the picture and the purpose of marriage, there are also problems that, that come into it that, uh, that, that need discussion, right? Sin causes a loss of intimacy in everything, right? Sin in our lives causes us a lack of intimacy with God. We're not as close to God as we should be. And therefore, we don't communicate with him if we lose this spiritual intimacy with him. Same way it is in a physical marriage. When sin enters our minds and our lives in either one of the parties, it loses its physical and spiritual intimacy. God never in intended for that to happen. Marital intimacy, spiritual intimacy, physical intimacy, whatever closeness one has in any relationship, it's lost because of sin. You know, the first thing after sin was a cover-up, right? The man and the woman disregarded God's law in not to eat of the tree that was in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
God said, in the day that you do it, you're going to die and your eyes are going to be opened. And when they did it, the God family had a discussion. They said, well, now they know what good and evil is. Now they understand that more. But the first thing they did when they sinned was that they tried to cover themselves. They tried to hide. Sin has that effect. It affected the intimacy of the relationship between man and God um, and with each other. So they hurriedly tried to hide. And then the first question that ever comes from the mouth of God was, where are you? Adam, where are you? What's happened to our intimacy here? And God said, did you do what I told you not to do? God wasn't searching for information, was he? Adam's eyes were being further opened of the terrible thing that he did. But they stepped out of God's given roles. What keeps a marriage together on fire and hot the way that God wants it? Stay within the God-given roles of that marriage. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and wives, submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. That's, gonna, that, that's the best. Now, man might not see it that way. Man doesn't see a lot of the things that God says from a worldly standpoint. Both the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame. Have you ever thought about that whole scenario there? It's an interesting one. God's standard of dress and modesty are first given right here. They put on themselves fig leaves, which might be comparable to a two-piece bikini today, but that wasn't enough for God because God said then he clothed them. They weren't clothed then. God clothed them and made coats of skins, and the two original Hebrew words indicate even the parameters of this dress. This one went from the shoulder to the knees. Interesting. And it doesn't seem like that idea changes throughout the Word of God. You need to study that. But anyway, there was this cover-up, and even though they covered up, it wasn't enough. And so, God endowed man with what we might call a shame meter. Yeah, a shame meter. And anything that goes outside of God's purpose sets off that shame meter. And sex is one of those things that can set it off. Have you ever wondered why any kind of sex outside of the husband and wife causes shame? Any sex outside of the husband and wife. Any sex outside of the husband-wife relationship, it first always causes shame. It sets off that shame meter. Now, we can decide to turn that off and ignore it and not act like it's there. And we can do that with anything. When, when we, you know when you first said that cuss word? Remember when you were a little kid, said the first one? You said, oh, ah, there was shame. But over time, you got used to it, used to it, used to it. So the shame meter is insensitive to that. We each have one. And in different areas, we've turned them off too soon by ignoring what brings shame. Well, this is the first time that Adam and Eve felt shame because they were naked and there was no shame. Now they tried to hide themselves because they lost their intimacy with each other and with God because they chose to sin. And sin does that. And it sets off the shame meter. Man has corrupted marriage through his defining of marriage and ignoring its boundaries. Polygamy is one of those things. You know, it's interesting you go to Africa and you can have as many wives as you want at the same time. Polygamy. America, there's all kinds of polygamy. You can contract as many marriages as you want, you just can't have all the wives at the same time. According to God's word, there's not one bit of difference. If I have previous spouses and I have not put them away for the cause of fornication, I've married again, I've got more than one spouse. And there's only one way to correct that. Now, we can change that parameter all we want. We can turn off our shame meter and act like, well, society accepts this now. It doesn't matter to God. It matters to God. It does. You need to reactivate your shame meter and read what God says about it and don't listen to what man says about it. Polygamy is the practice of contracting multiple wives. In our world, it just depends if you have them at the same time or not. 
Solomon in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22, and 1 Kings 11, 3, the Bible says he had 700 wives and 300 concubines, basically 1,000 wives. And we usually focus on, look at how many wives he has. But did you know he also had 1,000 mothers-in-law? <laughs> that to me is just as significant. Well, anyway. But the Bible says when he, when he played around, and, and don't use Solomon and, and David and, and the Old Testament characters and they had many wives as justification for having many wives either at the same time or at different times today. Jesus said in Matthew 19, 9 that for, from the beginning it was not so for man to tamper with the marriage relationship and man has been doing it ever since and will do it till the Lord comes again. But it doesn't make it right. Jesus said something totally different. He said, whoever divorces his wife, right, except for the cause of fornication, doesn't matter if they get drunk, doesn't matter if they're abusive, it doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, except for the cause of fornication, one exception, and marries another that has been put away for that cause, keeps on committing that word commit is in the present tense. It means it's a continuing action. As long as I'm with a wife or a husband that is not approved of by God, I keep on committing adultery. Man tampers that. Members of the church tamper that. You can go to churches of Christ in this city and hear their preachers teaching that. It doesn't matter. What did God... Anybody misunderstand verse 9? I think more people outside the church understand it than people inside the church when they're looking for an excuse. You see the problem with marriage? After seeing the picture of it, God's picture of it, the purpose of it, now this is the problem of it. It's how we think toward it. Humanity has corrupted marriage through, here's one of the more classic oxymorons ever, no-fault divorce. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A no-fault divorce? Anytime there's a divorce, there's a fault. A big one. Usually on both sides. More times than not on both sides. Might not be the fault of fornication, but there are faults, believe me. A no-fault divorce. Are you kidding? Man had to come up with that one. You won't read that in the Bible for sure. There are all kinds of oxymorons in life. Jumbo shrimp. Really? Really? Affordable health care. <laughs> mutual differences. Let's talk about our mutual differences. How about liquid gas? All kinds of. How about a humble Alabama fan? Oh. Yeah, they're going to get a chance again tomorrow night, perhaps. We'll see. No fault divorce? God intends marriage to be a lifelong endeavor. And we cannot teach and preach any less. That's why at the beginning of this lesson, I wanted all of our young marrieds to see how many marriages we have. 25, 35, 45, 55, 65 years. Marriage can be tough. Just like any relationship, but marriage because it's the most intimate. And I hope that during these next couple of lessons, as we think about unity, think about how much our church will be unified if the attitudes that are present in our own individual marriages are unified. Same mind. God wants us of the same mind of the same judgment, right? First Corinthians 1, spiritually. He wants married people like that. Of the same mind and the same... Mean there will be no disagreements? Uh, who would suggest such? But it's the attitude with which we take into those disagreements. And if I am guided by, honey, you first. And that's hard to do when you're first married. Because hopefully as you grow older and more mature, it becomes less and less about you. Just like the song, none of self and all of thee. Look to your spouse today and sing that song to him or her. Honey, none of self and all of thee. As we've seen the physical relationship of marriage and the spiritual relationship of marriage compared today. 
And Lord willing, we'll continue our thoughts next time. Does somebody need to go through a marriage ceremony today? Maybe you need to recommit your vows to your wife. You know, that's a good practice. Have you all recommitted your vows? There's a lot of ways to do that. Just same like there's a lot of ways to recommit to Christ. You can come down one of these aisles. You can recommit right there in your seat, in your heart. You can uh, get with somebody, confess faults with each other, and pray and recommit. Lots of ways of doing that. And I hope we all take advantage of that in our marriages physically and our marriage to God spiritually. We need to be recommitting all the time. God loves people when they repent. When they recommit, you've got an opportunity to do that. We're going to stand and sing an invitation song just from the Spirit's heart to your spirit. And I hope whatever way you choose to recommit and to have a marriage, spiritually and physically, as God wants it, you'll decide to do it now. And we'll stand and sing for your encouragement. Who at the door is standing? Patiently drawing near, entrance within demanding, whose is the voice I hear? Sweetly the tones are falling, open the door for me, if thou wilt heed my call. Excellent lesson, great reminders. Uh, I was thinking I could listen to that one all over again right away. That was that was great. Uh, it's good to have a reminder. It's good to be back with you. I've been uh, ill a little bit, as you may have heard. Thank you all for your prayers and cards and all those things and well wishes. I uh, appreciate that. I'm not 100% yet, but uh, most of the way back and uh, happy to be back. Uh, with that, we want to think about uh, many of the folks uh, that are sick and, and suffering, and uh, we're going to offer a prayer for those things at this time. Let's bow. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this Lord's Day. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had to come and worship you. We're thankful for uh, the lesson from your word. We're thankful that uh, we can have these relationships in our lives. And Father, most of all, we're thankful the relationship we can have with you. We're thankful that you give us that. We're thankful for the gifts and the grace that comes from that relationship. Thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for continuing to bless us with that forgiveness. Help us to continue to walk in the light and do the things that we ought to do uh, that we might be uh, counted as your people. We pray that you be with us, that we would look around about us and see those that don't enjoy those gifts, and we would have the desire and the, the interest to talk to them and, 
and tell them about the, the good news. Father, help us have the courage and, and strength and ability to go do those things. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick, those that are suffering with the, the COVID virus. We pray that you give them their health. Father, we're thankful for those that have been sick and recovered their health. We're thankful for those blessings. We pray that you be with those that are entering the hospital for surgery and procedures and, and things. We pray that you would give those that minister to them, the doctors and nurses, the ability and the, the skills to do what they need to do to bring healing. Father, we pray you'd be with them and their families as they go through these difficult times, as they're separated. Help them to be comforted. Father, we're mindful of those that recently lost loved ones. We pray that you'd, you'd comfort them and uh, the lonely times and the times without. We pray that we would not forget those and reach out and comfort those as well. We pray you'd be with us through the further scenes of today and this week and, and give us safety and look for those opportunities to share the good news. We ask all these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. We'll have one more song and be dismissed. Let's stand together as we sing In Christ Alone. And we'd like to remind everyone uh, to follow our COVID protocol. We'll dismiss from back to front and don't linger here in the auditorium. Please. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man, can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand.